Sometimes while exploring our wonderful world, we encounter amazing features that seemingly have no explanation. These situations can be challenging for a geologist, but also bring great enjoyment. What a beautiful day out here in the desert of Utah. I'm about 20 miles south of a community named Green River, and I'm out here to explore some fascinating features that my son-in-law Jason told me about. He knows this whole country really well, and he came across some of these features, and he didn't know what to think of them. And I found them quite interesting, and so I think you will too. And we're going to use the scientific method to try to understand just what, how these features were created and what was involved. I'm looking forward to this, and let's get going. Well, it's been a beautiful hike, a bit longer than I thought it might be. And I've come up over the hill, and here I think I see something over here. Let's go take a look, should we? Boy, it, this is looking interesting to me. Uh, hmm, is it circular? Not sure yet. I get the sense it is. Beautiful hiking out here. What a beautiful day. Wow. This looks pretty tall, taller than me. Yeah. Huh. It is circular, definitely. Wow, I can see already this is going to take some serious detective work. <laughs> you know, in geology, you get out and you hike around, you never know what you stumble on. Earlier I stum stumbled on some just amazing agates out here. Love the coloring in them, coming out of the Morrison Formation. But this, this is pretty, well, intriguing. What could, what could this be? I'll tell you what it reminds me of. It reminds me of tower ruins. They're quite common out in the desert in Utah, where the natives built these tower-like ruins that had sometimes multiple floors. This is a little different. The blocks look quite a bit bigger than the ones I've seen elsewhere, but it's sure neat. It kind of gives me a feeling that it's a little older Looks like it's kind of fallen apart in front here. But uh, let's take a little closer look at some of the features in here, okay? As I come up to this wall, oh, it's so beautiful. And I feel it. It feels, well, yeah. Feels like sandstone. Now that's not surprising, is it? Natives would be using sandstone and creating their, their structures. It is a sandstone and it's composed primarily of quartz and then darker colored lithic fragments or rock fragments. Large blocks that are circular shaped, these big stones, they almost look like they've been specially shaped just to fit around. The, these, uh, the corners, hmm, around the circle, so to speak. One other thing I'll point out is I see some uh, pretty interesting patterns in this stone, like this. See these lines in here? Those are interesting to me. Oh, here's a piece that's fallen off right here, right there. Very interesting lines all throughout the stone. Kind of an anastomosing pattern is what I call that network. You know, that network of veins or something in there. You know, I don't want to jump to any conclusions yet. When you first come upon something like this, you want to take your time. You want to look at it for a while and you want to hike around and see what else you might see. You never know. You know, I've noticed something about these anastomosing patterns. If we look at this rock here that's tumbled off, we see the patterns in there. And then we come into some rocks that are in place. See this lighter color 
sheet in here. I think that's one of those veins um, that are in there. Really fascinating. You can see the surface here, right down through here. Yeah. Hmm. So they seem to go down through the rock. You wonder what was going on, don't you? Let's just keep looking for clues. And here's another block that has these beautiful patterns in. I don't want to get too focused on these, but aren't they neat? I think they're beautiful. That's one reason I'm focusing on them. So, uh, wow, so we've got a few pieces of the puzzle to consider. So I've made a few early observations, and I know there's going to be quite a few more. And, and I certainly don't want to jump to any kind of conclusions until I get a chance to look around. I think I'm going to be hiking a few miles, and this could take a couple days. Uh, so we'll continue. Now, in the spirit of good science, I've taken some time, a couple hours, two or three hours, actually. I've really enjoyed this area and hiked around, just looking around for some features. And it turns out there are other very interesting features close by to here. So let's take a look at those and see if it adds to the story. Just a short walk away is another interesting feature. So here we have a, another rounded, nice circular wall that goes clear around. And it's over twice as big as the first feature. And it's more heavily eroded. It, it looks older, uh, or it's been more heavily eroded for sure. I did observe the anastomosing patterns here too. Let's go take a look at what I call feature number three. With another short hike, we come to the third feature. And to feature three, it's kind of hard to see from just a low camera angle like this, but from the drone, of course, what we saw was quite nice. The interesting thing about this, two things I'll point out. One is it's, it's the biggest one of all. It's 75 feet or so in diameter. Huh. And the wall is thinner. I'm saying the wall here is typically only a foot or so thick. So that's interesting to me. But I'll tell you something that really made me think. I had the good fortune of doing my master's field work in field geology on the Moen Kopi Formation uh, near the Grand Canyon. And as part of that, I got to do a lot of the ground geology at Wapaki National Monument, where they have many ruins. And one thing they have there that's really cool is a big circular ball court where they played ball. They had games that they played within that court. And I'll tell you, this kind of reminds me of a big ball court or something. Uh, yeah, it's just fun to think about. And I'm also thinking about the geology and what could possibly be creating features like this geologically. That's a puzzle too. I can tell you, no matter where we're going here, it's very exciting and it's very unusual, I believe. So another feature I want to show you is kind of a miniature version of everything. We've been seeing bigger things. What about this guy? He's only like three feet in diameter. Really interesting. He's got a, there's a kind of a hole in the middle of it. In fact, there's really good evidence for it as you come around the corner. This piece of rock here used to sit right on top. And you can see a, a well-formed, well, half circle. So we have another observation. Now we have miniature versions, and this one's beautiful. The next day, I met with a couple friends to go on a hike, and we encountered these two small versions as well. It looks like they're just coming right out of the sandstone. Well, we're going to keep on investigating, and let's see where it takes us.
The scientific method tells us that we should make an observation as something anomalous that we've done, and then you explore the broader region and you look for context, and you try to find other features that might help you understand what might be going on. And so you might think, well, I think I might have some ideas, and then you find this. Well, isn't this an amazing feature? Wow. You know, I love when you get out and hike around and see this great earth and all the creations around you, when you bump into things that just really impress you geologically and aesthetically as well. But to the observations of this, this really interesting feature, first of all, it's quite different from what we've seen. Really, hmm, the only thing that's the same is that it's circular, okay, and it has weathered out in relief. We've seen some that have weathered out in relief, some of them not so much. Furthermore, this feature has a cylindrical shape that is filled with fine-grained sandstone and siltstone and seems to be coming out from under the ground. Now, a couple other key observations I want to make here <clears throat> is that I see like a wrap, a sheath a wrapping of red siltstone around this. The core of this feature is a light-colored sandstone, and the outer edge is the typical darker red sandstone that we see in the area. In the front part here, the outer sheath of this red sandstone has been eroded away. Let's take a closer look at the contact between these two sandstones. Let's zoom in and look here. Isn't this a fascinating contact? It's quite sharp. Here's another view of it in a different area. Another observation is this is so different from all the rock around here. Instead of nice layers that we see in the, in the stratigraphy or the layering of the rock out here, we see this blobby look, big boulders that are irregular shaped and weathered out kind of smooth. Fascinating, isn't it? And if this is geologic, then I better have a good uh, hypothesis or a good set of observations that, that tell us how this could happen. Let's continue looking around and making observations of other features that have similarities to this. And hopefully with all these observations put together, we have our aha moment. Here is a similar large feature about a half mile away. Aren't these white lines that we see scattered across the sandstone interesting? It turns out these are fractures, and as you look at them, you can see that the color has been removed from the sandstone along the fractures. And it reminds me of what we've seen in the core of some of these features, where the color has been removed. Now this is interesting. Here we see a very circular feature that has negative relief. It's, it's a slight depression. And furthermore, it has a darker red sandstone within it. Looking from a much higher Google Earth view, we see the two features that we have just reviewed. And now we have a total of four large positive relief features. And if you look closely, there are several uh, negative relief or slightly positive relief features in this area. Here is a large feature being eroded out of the hillside. I was able to examine several like this. Many of the features have several concentric circles within it, as this feature shows well. Here I am for scale. I found several samples of the fascinating anastomosing fracture pattern in this one. In this region, we see many modestly sized positive relief features.
These four features are some 50 miles to the south of the main study area. Have fun counting up how many features you can see in this view. Well, it's getting late in the day. The wind has really come up. Uh, this is day two of exploring these features. I've had to go to my windy Wyoming hat because of this, but I wanted to summarize some of the things that we've observed about these features. Number one is the shape. Now, when we look down, they tend to be circular, sometimes very circular, when we look down from above on them. Uh, they also are cylindrical. They're tube-shaped, okay? Another thing we've observed is the bleaching of the rock. And we see that in parts of these uh, features, in some little sections of them. We've seen it along fractures in the area, some of these fractures heading right to these, these features and others in the general area. And so that's giving us a clue that fluids have moved along fractures near to these and within them to, to bleach out this uh, hematite staining. And speaking of fractures, remember this beautiful anastomosing network of fractures that we've seen. And you wonder, how does that happen? Wow, this wind. Uh, well, I've seen that happen where uh, volcanic material is injected into rock and it just fractures up and injects and makes these nice anastomosing fracture patterns. That's one time I've seen that uh, pattern. Hmm. Now, let's think of brainstorm a minute. This is where it's so fun to do geology is to brainstorm and think, where do I see that? If it's a geologic process and humans aren't involved, how could this happen? Well, what makes circular shapes and or cylindrical uh, tubes? Hmm. Mud pots and Yellowstone. You know, I'm reminded of those every time I cook oatmeal. I see bubbling bubbles come up through and they're circular shaped when looking down. Okay. Uh, karsting or sinkholes. We can have something underground that is dissolved and things start collapsing into into it and filling in the hole with new material. That's a possibility for sure. One obvious one is that we know volcanoes. When the magma from underneath comes from deep underground and up through the rock, it often is circular looking from above and tube shaped. That plug right in the core of the volcano. So it's, it's fun to be thinking, oh, wow, so we have a few options here, don't we? And how could this all tie together? So these are things for us to consider and think about. We're going to make some more observations, and then we'll tie it all together into an, an unbelievable geologic story. As I hike along, I decide that although the first feature was reminiscent of a tower ruin, it couldn't be man-made. There are too many other very large features that have no resemblance to man-made structures. In my mind, I rule out mud pots. These features are too large and are composed of sand. I also easily rule out volcanic involvement. I haven't seen any volcanic rocks. That leaves me with the karsting or the sinkhole hypothesis. Yet I haven't seen any collapsed pieces of rock that we call breccia within them. And there are other issues I have with this hypothesis. I'm thinking there's another, better idea. It's so fun to be out here in the wide open, all on your own, exploring the geology, enjoying the beauty. But one of the uh, side benefits that you receive is sometimes you discover something that, that really makes an impression on you and you have an aha moment and, oh, I've got it now. For some years, I've had a problem. And that is, I've been seeing some beautiful photographs with big holes and very resistant wind-blown or aeolian sandstone. And these big holes have cottonwood trees, some of them. They're so big and they're circular. And photographers have, have made beautiful photos of these scenes. And I couldn't figure out what geologic process could do such a thing. 
And so when I started this venture of looking for, at these positive relief features that we've been seeing, I didn't know that it, would realize, that it would come to an answer or help me come to an answer about the big circular holes. So here I am in an area where I have a nice hole in front of me. It's not real deep, this particular one. And now I understand what happened. The same process that created the positive features also, in some circumstances, created negative features and holes down into the ground. That means this material that was in here was less resistant to erosion than this sturdy sandstone I'm standing on and therefore it erodes more easily and creates a hole, a beautiful circular hole. Boy, this is fun. So we have two large, slightly positive features adjacent to well-defined holes that go into the sandstone. It seems to me that it's very likely that the same processes are responsible for both types of features. Here's another nice example of these holes in the sandstone. Notice the cows for scale. My observations here don't prove that the giant holes with trees in them some hundred miles away resulted from the same processes. But it seems likely to me. More work needs to be done. Well, we've made our observations and it's time to get down to it and figure out what happened. First thing, let's talk about karsting because that's been a, a key theory that we've used to think about. I have a sketch here to show karsting. It's cross-sectional with the tree here to show that. And down deep in blue here, I've put some rock layers in that can be dissolved by water. And this is typically limestone or dolomite, or maybe an evaporite like anhydrite. And it can dissolve and form a big cavern, and the rock starts collapsing within. So it forms the cavern, and all these layers above start collapsing down in, and it can work up through time. It can just keep collapsing and propagate clear up to the surface. I've seen them in seismic data propagate up from the original cavern some thousand feet or so. And one might imagine that, well, with groundwaters, now you have all this collapsed material in here that it could cement up really tight, a very common process, and make it very durable and resistant to erosion. And then this rock around here can't erode as quickly. And you have a a positive feature like we've observed. Um, <clears throat> so it's a very viable theory, but I don't like it. And why? Well, all these collapse blocks are very angular and they can be very big and right down to the small, but they're angular and they're obvious. And I haven't seen any in any of these features, these collapse blocks. We've also seen very small features, three feet in diameter, if you have a hole in the ground that's just three feet in diameter down underneath somewhere, or maybe a little bigger, it's not going to collapse like a karst. And finally, the rock that could potentially collapse is some 4,000 feet deeper than the rock we've been observing. The rock we're observing, have been observing, is the Entrada Formation, Jurassic Age, and and this unit down here that could potentially karst like I'm talking about is some 4,000 feet deeper. So for all those reasons, I'm just not comfortable with the karsting theory. And that puts me in a real pickle because now what? Uh, I don't have any volcanic rock. It reminds me some of volcanic features. We see especially, you know, the fracturing and, and this network, this anastomosing network of veins that occurs in high-pressure situations, like I've mentioned, in, in intrusive volcanics or in granites that intrude the country rock. You'll see these patterns of forceful injection. So with these observations, really what you need is a volcano of sand and silt. That seems rather impossible, doesn't it? Well, it turns out there is a possible way for that to occur. I'm sure many of you have had the experience of walking down along a beach 
and having fun with your kids or grandkids or siblings or something and you get there just above the water ways and you start jumping around and everything starts getting kind of weird on you, doesn't it? You have water start coming up, the, the, you start sinking into the ground and that's called liquefaction. And I've found a little place here along a creek near my house that I hope will demonstrate this principle for those of you that aren't familiar with it. So I'm above the water, I'd say, oh, a good foot. And let me walk out here. It feels pretty firm right here. And, if I, and, and then if I start doing this, just tapping my foot. Oh, it's all ready. This is happening pretty quickly here. I probably could have gone higher up on the bank. Just tapping around. A large area is starting to get uh, kind of jiggly, kind of like jello. This is very fine grained here, more of silt. It's not a nice sand to demonstrate it better. But you see, I'm just going down, down until I hit hard ground underneath here. And if there were more sand under here, I could keep, keep going probably to my waist. Even old guys like me can have fun in the sand and the mud. It's getting hard to move my feet around. <laughs> There's water coming out and running off down below. This is kind of like quicksand. And there I am up on solid ground again. So it turns out that this process that we call liquefaction is the key to all the features that we've been observing. Now there's more than just pure liquefaction involved. We have to have some special conditions. Maybe you'll think of them if you think about it a minute. But this is the fundamental principle at play. Boy, this liquefaction is pretty interesting and we need to know a bit more about it so we can understand these, these features in the end, right? I have three glasses that I've sketched here full of sand. This first glass, let's focus on it. These lar larger circles in here are sand grains, so we're zoomed in. This is just a schematic. Now let's put water in there and I'll just sketch a little blue in the in between the sand grains. It completely fills with water. I'm not going to do that. That'd take forever. Okay. All the way up. So it's fully water saturated. <clears throat> now, this you can see is high porosity. In, in other words, there's a lot of uh, empty space in here. 45% is typical. If you just take sand and deposit it, put it in a cup, uh, whatever, and not compact it, 40, 45% of the space is empty. And we filled it with water. But if you look closely, I've tried to sketch it here, the sand grains are still all touching each other to support weight. So when I walk out on this and stand on this, my weight is being supported by the actual sand grains, not the water, the sand grains. But if you shake it up, like I did with my feet, or like an earthquake could do, well, then the world changes. And that's step two right here. You see, when you shake things, they want to resettle down and compact more efficiently and better. That's how it kind of works. So you start to shake it, and these gra uh, sand grains are no longer in contact with each other. Let me put some water in here in between all these sa uh, sand grains. All over in here with this blue water. But the grains no longer are touching each other, so that means it can't support weight. It's more like a liquid. It really is a liquid at this point. 
And this is what causes all the problems in certain situations in earthquakes where buildings start to sink in or cars just sink in. Just, wow, kind of magical. Terrifying, but interesting. Because it loses the strength. And then to phase three, and that's where all the sand grains have resettled. They're more efficiently compacted now. Let's say instead of 45% porosity, they have 40% porosity. Or instead of 40, they have 35 or something along like that. You still have water between all the sand grains here, but, but you don't have near as much within the sand because it's compacted better. So the water leaves and comes up and fills in. So the total volume of sand and water is the same as over here. It's just that a lot of the water now is just free floating right here on top of the sand. Wow. And that's why in earthquakes, sometimes they'll see water on the surface as it just comes up out of nowhere. All of a sudden you have like lakes forming. Fascinating, isn't it? And you wonder to yourself, well, how does this create these features? And that's a fair question because nothing I've shown you here really would create what we've been looking at. You have to have this in combination with some special conditions. And here are the special conditions. Cross-sectional view, I've got my little tree here. Layers, layered rock that are seals, meaning th uh, fluid has a hard time pushing through it, like shales and siltstone sometimes too, uh, <clears throat> that interbedded here. And we see that out where we're at, above the sandstones that I was hiking around, we would see these nice layered rocks like this. And then you have the nice sandstone, high porosity. It has not yet started to cement together, which is so common in geology, as the sand grains and any rocks and carbonates, anything, as it gets buried uh, through time, it starts to cement together through precipitation of cement in the water. Well, this hasn't happened. High porosity. Hasn't compacted, not buried very deep, uh, <clears throat> deeply. As near as I can tell, my estimates are, uh, you know, 100 feet or so, 200 feet of burial depth, not very deep. Water in between all these sand grains. So it's fully saturated, like we saw in the, in the cup, in the glass. And the first example. This is an unstable situation, potentially, if you shake the ground. Now, when you shake the ground, instead of uh, all this weight of this rock being supported by sand grains, as you'll recall, now it's being supported by water. Essentially, it's supported by liquid. And this is a very unstable situation. It turns out that the pressure, the weight, the pressure on this is a function of how thick this is, of course, how much weight you have, and it's about one PSI per foot. So let's say that's 100 feet. You've put 100 PSI of pressure on here, on this fluid. That's like having a hose. If you buried a hose down under here, 100 feet, and had it 100, 100 PSI, well, that's way high pressure. Rock, through lots of studies, we know can only handle about 0.7 psi per foot. So it can, at 70 psi, it breaks. That's a good uh, rule of thumb. So it just can't handle all this pressure sitting underneath of this fluid, and it immediately, violently, and I mean immediately when you have an earthquake, this, this cannot support it. This water has to escape. It has to, and immediately, and violently. So it breaks through, just like a volcano breaks through to the surface, right up, fluids coming out, water pouring out onto the surface like this. And it's such a violent, powerful movement that it brings sand too with it. The sand and the silt in here, it, it brings it up as well all through here and creates a sand volcano. <laughs> well, there you go. And it has this pipe right here where it brings up all the sand. So just how much water could this be? 
Well, it's fairly easy to estimate. I mean, using some, you have to make some assumptions. But we know the sandstone, the Entrada sandstones, 200 feet thick or so. The Navajo sandstone, which does this as well, is like 500 feet thick. And imagine if you have 40% porosity in there and you reduce that to 35% porosity, what that really means is for if you have for every 100 feet, you would have five feet of water because of that, if you reassemble uh, the sand grains and compact them more efficiently. And this happens almost instantly. So in the uh, Entrada case, in the Slick Rock Entrada case, that's 200 feet. That's like 10 feet of water immediately. That's like almost like a lake coming here, and it's got to get rid of it, all that water. These features, as near as I could tell, looking at some of the hillsides where we could see them in the hillsides, pushed up through easily 100 to 150 feet of rock. And think of all these features we've seen. I'm quite confident that all of those occurred essentially at one time. Can you imagine walking around out there, having an earthquake go off and have all these sand volcanoes, some small, some big, just going off everywhere all around you? It'd be uh, rather alarming. And now that you've had this violent pressure release, at some point it kind of relaxes, and you have this full of sand, and now you have a conduit for fluids to flow through, through time, through geologic time. And this can be cemented up. We're always cementing rock. You're going to learn with me. And become more durable than what's around it. To make it really clear how we're left with these positive features and negative features, let's erode this through time. But before I do that, we, I showed you at least one example where we had most of the feature just still sitting in the hillside, right up through clear to pretty much the top. Now, erosion takes over. And let's assume that this pipe is strong. It's been cemented good. So we start eroding things away through time. Erode this, and we keep, keep coming down. But we get to this layer, okay? But we're left with this positive feature. Right here. I'll put it in red here. And it erodes down to there. But it keeps going. But this is always higher. It stays higher because it just can't erode as quickly. So we keep moving it down, moving it down. And finally, let's say we get clear down here. Erode it off. Erode everything away. This is several of them we saw this way. Many of them right down to there. And so there you have it, a positive relief circular or tubular shaped feature poking above the ground. And then of course we can have the opposite happen where this is weaker and it just maintains a hole in the ground of various depths. Well, I can only hope you've enjoyed this as much as I've enjoyed making this video. Thank you for watching.